identity. Identity answers one of the most fundamental human questions. Who am I? We're assigned identity by our societies. We're gifted aspects of identity by our families. And as we develop, we form our own identities through experience. We learn in this process over time that our identities are not static. The three building blocks of our ever-evolving identities, what we're assigned, what we inherit, and what we imagine, the choices we make in the present. There's an implied choice in identity. There's potential agency available to us there. Part of my identity spawns from my prehistory, my inheritance. My ancestors were stolen from West Africa and defied all odds and suffered servitude over generations against the colonial backdrop of a tiny island off the coast of Venezuela called Trinidad and Tobago and a tinier island called Grenada. Both islands have the colonial residue of the French, Spanish, and British. In both places, the indigenous Taino and Carib peoples were massacred. Their genocide and sacrifice are woven deeply into my story as well. This colonial trauma inflicted by imperial powers from Europe, often at war with each other for the spoils of land, bodies, labor, spices, gold, is an American historical fact. And by America, I mean America in its broadest sense from the southernmost tip of Chile to the northernmost point in Canada. Slavery, indigenous genocide, and colonization is a collective inheritance that tie us all together in this room. The great colonial traumas that to this day bewilder and vex us. What does it mean to have an identity that's wound up in so much historical trauma? We'll answer that question, but before we do, let's fast forward from our colonial past to the mid-60s. Picture, if you will, my grandmother migrating to this country, leaving 10 children behind to work in the homes of others, caring for the young of others, bringing with her in her knapsack little but what she was assigned, what she inherited, and thankfully, what she imagined and created on the spot seemingly by magic with her domestic worker salary and the promise of her slave ancestors. Fast forward a little bit more, 1997. Small town, working class suburban New York, a diverse place made up of ethnic white people, a collage of immigrants from Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, African Americans with their roots in the South, all intermingling. Here I am, senior year of high school. I'll never forget having a particular conversation, final weeks before graduation. I'm in class, I'm talking to this white girl. I don't remember the details of the conversation, but in response to something I said, she says, nigga, please. I don't know about y'all, but where I'm from, racial slurs from somebody outside your group is grounds for a fight. And if that girl had been a guy, the story would have taken a kinetic turn. I'm talking fisticuffs. I said something to the effect of, you can't use that word with me. She freaked out started crying, she left. The next day, I got a call from a teacher who heard about the disagreement. This was a call asking for peace. And he said, wouldn't it be nice if you just told her it was okay? <laughs> what did I do? Well, my granny, who had at that point joined the ancestors, was with me in spirit. She didn't forge magic for me to bow to white supremacy in that moment. That was a moment where my identity was called into question and I chose my truth when those around me called for safety, calm, and decorum. I chose to be an agent when asked to be a subject. Does that make sense? Okay. The teacher, the adult, he didn't say she used the N-word on, on you, are, are you okay? He wanted this to go away and he wanted it to go away at my expense. To quote Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, the teacher was 
and I quote, more devoted to order than to justice through the absence of tension. The teacher's goal was not on mitigating the harm of racism. It was about making sure everything appeared to be all right, courtesy of my silence. It was a treatment of the symptoms, her tears, versus the deeper disease of racism. That little vignette, that little story from my past is a microcosm of the society we live in where we're told to be patient and grateful while always showing deference to the discomfort of others in the issuing of our pleas for justice or our righteous screams for relief. Do I have a witness here who, know what, who knows what I'm talking about? We're asked politely to be subjects of the status quo and told we would be rewarded for our obedience. Now, how does this relate to this room? We need philanthropy that knows the difference between the tears of the colonizer and the tears of the slave. Both cry, but one out of shame and the other cries for justice. There's a difference. We need a philanthropic practice that refuses to be subject to the conditions of the present, but with your feet planted in the present, dares to be agents of a yet unimagined future. Philanthropy has a choice to make here. Philanthropy can either be a venue for the working class to get free and to build power, or it could be the public relations arm of organized capital. I'm gonna say that again. Philanthropy can either be a venue for the working class to get free and build power, or it could be the public relations arm of organized capital. And, and we see this in practice often. Writer Anand Garagadas calls this image laundering. In 2014, the Koch brothers gave the United Negro College Fund a $25 million grant. As a result, the United Negro College Fund Koch Scholars program was created. Charles Koch gave another $26 million to HBCUs to support criminal justice research. And they are spending millions of dollars on Libre, an organization that helps the right wing connect with Latinx millennials and young folks. If you're a casual observer, you might say, Maurice, it's fantastic that the Koch brothers love black and brown people so much that they'd invest a fraction of their wealth on causes that uplift us. Well, the truth is that all philanthropy is not equal. All money ain't good money. Or to put it another way, some money's too expensive. There's a reason we say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But rather than assuming good intentions, I would prefer we look at people's actions. For example, the Koch brothers love black and brown people so much that they put their financial and political capital behind Florida governor turned presidential candidate Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis, who we all know loves black and brown people so much that he's trying to eliminate DEI from schools and ban books written by people of color, erase ethnic studies, and make life harder for immigrants and LGBTQ people. This is philanthropic image laundering. When you give a community a proverbial high five with the left hand and a sucker punch with the right hand. One takeaway I hope I can leave you with is this. All philanthropy, all philanthropy is political. The Koch brothers, the Koch brothers' philanthropy is completely aligned with their politics. What politics, I ask, or lack thereof of politics is your giving aligned with I would argue that political neutrality is itself a political choice that inevitably cedes the direction of our country to those that affirm the status quo. An affirmation of the status quo, trust me, is a very serious ideological and political project that feels like neutrality to some and to others is a death sentence. So, do you have a clear, articulated North Star? 
through which every decision can be measured. Without a North Star, it leads to incoherence and potential chaos, both in your grant making and in your workspaces, and it also means you're likely not achieving impact. Last year, I wrote an article called Building Resilient Organizations. Thanks, thanks, thank you, readers. <laughs> um, and I wrote this article to provide some tools for organizations navigating internal conflicts and external contradictions. By the way, if you haven't read it and you're getting FOMO, um, you, we have a, a method for you to quickly be able to get the article for your reading assignment on your trip home. Just text HIP for Hispanics in Philanthropy, HIP to 30403. If you do that, it'll just be zoomed onto your phone and then you could read it on your plane ride back home. HIP to 30403, great. So the best tool, the foundational tool of navigating conflict is not your training or professional development budgets, although those are great, it's having a clear North Star. Your North Star says that this is why we exist and this is what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. As leaders and managers, it's our responsibility to make sure the people in our midst understand the organization's charge. The root of our conflicts is often a general lack of clarity about what we do and how we do it. In conflict, the arbiter should, should always be mission. The arbiter should not be the most charismatic, most popular, or loudest voice in the room. Yep, I see, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. If you can stay focused on a North Star, you can work through a lot of things. And it's my job at WFP and your job as funders to create that clarity if it's lacking and to continuously affirm it once the mission is clear. At the Working Families Party, our North Star is building governing power for working people, six words. This is how we decided to make an intervention last year to help Working Families Democrat Delia Ramirez make history becoming the first Latina elected to Congress from the Midwest. or last month to help a classroom teacher and community organizer named Brandon Johnson use the power of organizing to overcome a significant fundraising disadvantage to become Chicago's 57th mayor. <laughs> Give it up, Chicago. Or in this very moment to fight and defeat neo-fascism in this country. And I would challenge all of you to make a similar intervention in your organizations. This is a fight. It's not a fight in which somebody wins an election and the losing side shakes hands and goes home until next time. This is a fight with high stakes because fascism is fatal. We've chosen to intervene because losing means people die from the violence of extreme weather, the violence of poverty, or the violence of human cruelty. As the protest chant goes, which side are you on? If you don't already have clarity and a North Star at this moment, it's time to get one. But this clarity is around the, the conflict I mentioned earlier. Will your version of philanthropy be a tool for the working class or a PR agent for organized capital? Trust me, it's not an easy question to answer. And it doesn't always have easy answers. But the fact that you choose to ask the question is more important than the answer that you arrive at. What I've learned is that these hard questions are contradictions to be managed, not yes, no, right, wrong scenarios. Holding on to these contradictions while maintaining and supporting a North Star and having strategic clarity is key. If we can do that, I truly believe we can make amazing things happen for working people in this country. Following your North Star is a choice. It's a choice our ancestors made as they traveled the Underground Railroad to freedom, literally following the North Star to liberation. What they did then is what we must do and what we must continue to do today. With that combination of the three building blocks I spoke of, assignment, inheritance, and imagination that make up our identity, they inherited collective trauma like we inherit collective trauma. And they chose to have agency in deciding what to do with that inheritance. We can be anchored by our traumas forming an identity that is only in conversation with the trauma of colonization, stuck almost in a conversation about our subjugation. 
We can choose to have the various ways we heal from or understand or find language for our trauma as opportunities to attack one another. The labels and words we may use to identify our struggles, never completely satisfying or precise, often become weaponized and we find cause to use them against one another. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The remnants of slavery, colonization, genocide, and apartheid will have us clinging to pieces of our identity forged in trauma. Who is Caribbean? Who is Latin American? Who is Afro-descendant? These are questions that can turn into me versus you if we let them, instead of us versus colonization. Of course, we ask these questions. Of course, we debate and disagree. But we must never stop to ask them. We must always ask them on the journey towards freedom. Because on the other side of trauma is healing and collective resilience. We could allow the trauma to tear us apart, or we can investigate that trauma and find a way through together. I'm here to tell you we all are trying to come to terms with the same American predicament, all of us. And if we choose it, that shared reality can be a site for curiosity and solidarity. Again, only if we choose it. That would mean we released our tight hold on the story of trauma and recognized underneath there was a story of resilience. that we released our tight hold on the past actions of colonizers and turned our heads to the promise of future generations. The facts of our collective traumas and oppression are historical fact, despite the efforts of some to erase them. They are true. Now what? What do we do with the information? What do we do with all of that data? What do we do with those facts in the present? We can choose to turn on one another, saddled with grief and suspicion, or we can choose to turn towards one another, towards multiracial democracy, towards solidarity, towards principle struggle. Our obligation as people, and especially in this room, people in leadership, I believe, is to do the latter. That is how we make liars out of the colonizers. That's how we resist the pull for us to be subject to the status quo. So let's go back in our time machine that I've decided we're all in. Zoom to 2008. We elected a one-term senator from Chicago with a funny name and a flair for oration named Barack Hussein Obama. Obama ushered in Democratic supermajorities and got the ever-elusive 60 Senate seats. People, very, very smart people, people who other people pay to write smart things, were talking about at that time, if you remember, remember where you're at, the end of racism. <laughs> and even though a lot of people of color, a lot of black folks, a lot of Latinx folks knew this was a pipe dream, we were allowed, maybe for the briefest of moments, to think this was a turning point in America. Eight years later, the same country that elected the first black president elected a wannabe strongman who idolized actual dictators, openly pandered to racists, and bragged about sexually assaulting women. What's, what's, the lesson, what's the lesson here? The lesson here is that the future of our country is not predetermined. If you told anyone of sound mind that Barack Obama would be seceded by Donald Trump in 2016, you'd likely be laughed out the room. But Donald Trump is proof that having a North Star, having conviction, having the confidence that maybe only a truly mediocre white man could ever have, <laughs> can change the direction of society. In a very odd way, Steve Bannon, Steve Miller, Donald Trump and a small extreme and very fringe group of folks in the right wing of the Republican Party proved something very instructive for all of us. They had clarity and belief in their North Star and strategy, even when others didn't take them seriously. They were focused and clear, and they didn't fall into the cynicism that 
could say maybe that they could not do this, that they could not imagine a new future. And here we are living in that future after the quote unquote end of racism. We are facing the greatest coordinated attacks on racial justice in a generation. If a con man, a political strategist, and an organized group of people who believe in wild conspiracies can create a North Star that radically changes the direction of the world in a mere eight years, imagine the changes that could happen if the people in this room decide that they want to be truly on the side of the working class. If your institutions discipline themselves towards a North Star, as hard as that is, as much internal debates that will naturally create, what is possible on the other side? If we can change our workplaces in that effort, I believe that we could change our communities. And if we could change our communities, we could change our cities, we could change our cities, then we could transform our states. And if we could transform our states, we could change the entire country. And if we do that, we may transform the entire world. And that is how we get free. Thank you. Thank you.